We also get frightened witless about sea level change. Now sea level goes up and down like a yo-yo. And there are many, many reasons for sea level change. It is not only the expansion of water and it is not only the melting of ice. This is the global average sea level changes based on satellite measurements, one of the many ways of doing it. Incredibly difficult and probably uh, got a lot of errors in it. But we hear a lot about Tuvalu and we hear poor old Tuvalu is going to be inundated. The problem with Tuvalu is it sits on part of the Pacific Ocean where the ocean floor is sinking. No wonder they're getting inundated. <laughs> it's exacerbated by the removal of coral to build a, a Second World War airstrip, the blasting out of the atoll, the pumping of water, underground water, which allows greater compaction, and Tuvalu is sinking. Now, that's no surprise. We've known that since 1830 when Lyle published a book called Principles of Geology. We've known it from Charles Darwin's time. He published a book in 1842 on coral reefs. And coral reefs sit on top of old volcanoes. And after the volcano has vented itself, it starts to sink and the coral keeps growing. Now that idea has been around for well over 150 years. It was tested by Professor Sir Edgeworth David, then at Sydney University, by drilling a hole funded by the New South Wales Government, drilling a hole out of Tuvalu, could, and drilled through the coral and couldn't get to the volcano at the bottom. The Japanese tried the same. They again failed. They got down to a couple of thousand metres. And it wasn't until the 1950s, when the French were drilling holes in coral atolls for their nuclear testing, that Darwin's idea was confirmed, and that is that you have a submarine volcano, coral grows, the volcano subsides and keeps growing, and in the case of the Bikini Atoll, we have some four kilometres of coral reef sitting on top of a subsiding part of the ocean floor. So what we've known for at least 150 years is that coral does not die when sea level rises. Coral actually loves it and it grows and it grows and it grows. So this information is freely available. This information is in the literature. All you've got to do is to type in Coral Atoll Darwin and you'll find it. So, and this is again a very selective use. Frightening people witless that sea, sea level is going to rise. Sea level rises, sea level falls and there's a huge amount of information out there in the literature to show us various reasons why sea level rises and falls. Now, we've got some measurements in Australia about sea level rise. And I'll pick Port Pirie because that is the greatest sea level rise in Australia. Now, this Port Pirie record was studied by Tony Berperio, who we, many of us know from Minotaur, when he was with the South Australian Government, and published this work. And he looked at the measuring station. He showed that at Port Pirie, the measuring station was a pier and that pier has been sinking <laughs> so sea level has been rising now that's in the literature why don't we hear about that we can go anywhere in coastal Australia and we can see that 6,000 years ago sea level was about 2 metres higher it was a global sea level rise 6,000 years ago it was considerably warmer any of those people in the mineral sands industry know that 125,000 years ago, sea level was about six or seven metres higher. That's why we've got all these lakes and lagoons up eastern Australia. That is the result of a sea level retreat and then a sea level rise, but we had a very high sea level. So sea levels are up and down for a great diversity of reasons. Land levels also change. The Romans knew that Londinium was sinking we still know that London is sinking. That's why we have the Thames barrier. We know that Scotland's rising. We know that Scandinavia is rising. Scandinavia has risen about 340 metres in the last uh, 10,000 years. The castle of Turku in, in southern Finland was built on an island out to sea. You can walk to that island now and you're about four metres above sea level because all the land's lifted. So as one part of the country is rising, another part is sinking. So when we covered Scandinavia with three kilometres of ice, it sank and somewhere else rose. Now we've taken that ice off, Scandinavia is rising and the Netherlands is sinking and it's been happening for a very long period of time. Sea level changes are quite normal 
Land level changes are quite normal. The port of Ephesus is 15 kilometres inland. It's mentioned in your Bible. The uh, town of Mary Magdalena, it's a port, or was a port. It's now above sea level. The town where coins were invented, Lydia, I've sailed over it. It's a couple of metres beneath you. You can actually sail over the streets and have a look at them. The land has sunk. So if you're going to try to work out sea level changes, you have to know what the land's doing. And that doesn't come into the equations. So I think we're being grossly misled. And there's a lot of in information out there telling us about all the methods that we can have for sea level change. But we never hear about that. We ne never hear that there is a very, very contrary view in the scientific literature. This is literature which is well known. And sea level goes up and down. We wouldn't have a petroleum industry or a coal industry if we didn't have changes in sea level. So, again, we're only getting some of the story. Carbon dioxide, that gas that is meant to be a pollutant. Well, wrap your arms around a tree and ask it, is your food poison? <laughs> because that is plant food. No matter how you look at that diagram, and there are five models there, no matter how you look at the models for carbon dioxide, the five proxy measurements of carbon dioxide show us that carbon dioxide is lower now than it has been in the last 500 million years. Now, if it gets much lower, we won't have any vegetation. We won't have any algae. We won't have any bacteria. So we have a very, very low carbon dioxide content. We know that at times we've had a low carbon dioxide content and very hot climates. We know we've also had a very high carbon dioxide content and cold climates. There's very little break, very little link. And carbon dioxide is a bit like having windows on the blind. You pull down the blind and you get some light blocked out. So the first 200 parts per million of carbon dioxide does that. You put a second blind there, it's not, not much more light that gets blocked out. You put a third blind, it has no effect. And that is in effect the relationship of carbon dioxide and temperature. As you increase the carbon dioxide content, it's only the first 200 parts per million or so that has an effect. After that, where we are now, 382 parts per million carbon dioxide, double it, it does nothing. Quadruple it, it does nothing. How do we know that? Because we've seen in past geological environments carbon dioxide contents of 5%. We didn't have a tipping point, we didn't have a runaway greenhouse. So if we ignore the basic chemistry of carbon dioxide, we can come up with a frightening story. But carbon dioxide has been very, very much higher in the past, and it only really operates as a greenhouse gas when we've got very, very little vegetation on the planet. And carbon dioxide, most of the emissions come from natural sources. And most of the emissions we don't even put into our calculations. We come to that in a second. So we look at these typical ice core measurements showing in blue carbon dioxide and red temperature. Temperature goes up, up to a, a, a temperature much higher than today. And then it stops and it goes down. Why haven't we had a runaway greenhouse? That's because we've ignored the most common abundant greenhouse gas and it's called water vapour. And that has a greater greenhouse effect than carbon dioxide. And so we can see that. Water vapour is the main greenhouse gas. If we increase temperature, we increase the amount of water vapour in the atmosphere. To evaporate water vapour involves heat. To precipitate water vapour into rain involves heat. If you've got ice in your drinks at zero degrees Celsius, that ice will not melt. You've got to add heat to it to make it melt. And the latent heat of water buffers our temperatures such that we don't have a runaway greenhouse or a runaway ice house. The carbon dioxide content is absolutely pathetically small. It is a trace gas in the atmosphere. But what's even more interesting is if you look at that vertical white line between two and three, you can see just on the right um, of that vertical white line, the temperature deduced from ice core has gone up. And about 800 years later, carbon dioxide goes up. Carbon dioxide doesn't drive climate, it follows. 
and that's because of its inverse solubility. Uh, that's well known in chemistry. So as you increase temperature for natural reasons, you start to evaporate carbon dioxide and take it out of water. That's well known, but we hear very little about that. We do hear something about it, but very little about it. <coughs>